How do you consider podcasting can be employed most powerfully as a teacher? Thanks. I think, um, I think I'll answer this question by talking about my own practice as a teacher from about five or six years ago. And although the context for this is a sixth form college, I think the general pedagogic principles are the same, be it sixth form or secondary school or primary school. I think it might play out in a slightly different way, but the principles remain pretty much the same. Um, I guess the best way of describing myself originally was an e-learning cynic. Um, and I quite like the fact that it's podcasting itself as a powerful kind of educational tool which has led to me becoming an advocate of e-learning over the last few years. So let me give you an example. Um, about 10 years ago when I worked in a college we first got our first VLE, our first virtual learning environment. And what really struck me at the time was there was little pedagogic conversation about what is this thing and how do we use it. And it seemed to me that there was almost a it's new, therefore it must be good type approach to e-learning in the early years. Now, what worried me about VOEs was that they might be e, but they're not necessarily learning. So the idea is that we would put resources on a VOE, which I think are incredibly valuable, and learners might have access to some you know, material archive, or there might be tools they can download and use for homework. But having stuff stored isn't actually the same as learners using it. And in fact, learners downloading and viewing it isn't the same as learners learning from it. So as an e-learning cynic, I, I kind of held off using my VOE until I found something which I thought really genuinely added value to the learning that my learners were doing. And that thing was podcasts. So interestingly, while being an e-learning cynic, at the same time I was an early adopter of an iPod, um, I've consumed podcasts made by you know, ordinary people and also companies like the BBC, etc. Um, listen to podcasts an awful lot on my journey into work. And I guess the moment came when, when I realised that you know, my portable practice of listening to audio and carrying it around with me is clearly something which my learners could also engage with. Although, I, again, I had a kind of question mark about the accessibility for all learners of digital and portable media equipment, because you know, I don't think we can, we can take that for granted. So as a sociology teacher, what I started to do is to record podcasts. And I had a number of rules, which will be a subject of another video which we're making as part of this series. But essentially, the rules were that they'd be short, they'd be about information delivery, they'd repeat the key words three or four times to really kind of make that point and, and kind of deliver that message to the listener. They would be timed at certain key moments in the kind of year that, that I had with those learners, maybe linked to essays, linked to certain key moments of assessment in the scheme of work, or even in fact just linked to the act of revision because these were you know, A-level revision classes. And what I would do is I would use podcasts as a medium to extend and add value. So they weren't essential, they weren't compulsory. At the time they were heavily scripted, and the idea would be that there'd be this extra resource which learners could use, which would extend, uh, in a different way, their revision and their learning. Now, I tried an experiment, and I made a few, three or four podcasts. I recalled them as MP3 files, so they're accessible to most people who could play them. I recorded some off the cuff, a little bit like this interview now, and I recorded some heavily, heavily scripted. And I didn't tell learners which one was which, and I got a group of learners together, played them the podcasts, and actually asked them if they could you know, give me some feedback. Was, was this useful? Would they use it? Did it sound just ridiculously awful? Or in fact, you know, do I really sound like that? And, and that really was an issue I had to come to terms with quite, quite quickly in this process. Um, the overwhelming feedback from the learner was the off-the-cuff podcasts were better than the heavily scripted ones because they just sounded more natural, they were more rich, they were warmer, they were more engaging, and it did sound like having me you know, in their pocket, as it were. That was the single best thing I think I ever did, was starting to record tiny podcasts, having them on the VOE, having them stored, having them available for download. 
And what was really dramatic for me about that experience was the dramatic take-up, the huge, huge interest in it from the learners. But it was always separate from, but parallel to, the actual learning in the lessons because of you know, the issue of digital divide and the issue of accessibility. Now, having said that, that was six years ago. So I suspect things might be different now certainly in terms of the availability of smartphones and the availability of other kind of personal media players, but also kit and tools in colleges and schools itself has improved. So lots of schools now have banks of computers with headphones and speakers. They have laptops which you can plug headphones into. So actually the accessibility issue on site is probably largely solved now in most schools and colleges. So that's how I use podcasts. I use them initially as a means for learners to get extra content, separate to, but parallel from their lessons, and it was overwhelmingly successful in terms of how the learners responded and used, and in fact came to really quite significantly rely upon those as key aspects in the kind of delivery of our subject.